Oh. Oh. Elden Ring. Oh. Oh. Two years. Two whole years since Elden Ring was unleashed upon us, and nothing has been the same since. Racism is no more, world hunger is nothing but a distant memory, and the only problem we collectively face as a species is that we still haven't gotten that DLC yet. But in all seriousness, Elden Ring turned out to be a much more monumental game than even I expected. Now don't get me wrong, I was beyond hype for this game, and I knew it was going to be incredible before we even saw a lick of gameplay. And when they first dropped that first gameplay trailer and demos, and I saw that Elden Ring was essentially an open world Dark Souls 3 with a jump button, I damn near passed out in that moment from all the blood rushing from my head to my urchery. An open world version of one of my favorite games of all time? You couldn't pay me to not buy it. And I did, along with seemingly 20 million others, making Elden Ring from software's greatest success story yet. There probably isn't much I can say about this game that hasn't already been said already, but I thought it would be again, cool and fun, to do a review of Elden Ring after two years, and with the DLC ready to drop its load on us in the summer. I think the timing is just about right, and I'll do a video on that too, don't worry. So let's ring this elder and enter the lands between. Elden Ring is From Software's first open world game, sending our tarnished asses to the lands of the lands between, a strange and jagged landmass that's seemingly isolated from the rest of the world by a massive ocean and a fog, and is ruled over by the living god Queen Merica the Eternal in her golden order. Now you probably already know that Elden Ring has some pretty rich lore. From Software are masters of environmental and non-linear storytelling, and this time, they've teamed up with legendary fantasy writer George Rorge Rartan Martin, who obviously wrote the Song of Ice and Fire novels that the Game of Thrones show is based off of. Now, it's a little unclear how much work was done between George and FromSoft, but from some interviews, it seems that George wrote the background and the lore of Elden Ring, and FromSoftware expanded on the lore with their world and character designs. So we can blame George for all the similar-sounding demigod names and putting sacks at the end of all the dragon names. Now, this lore is thick. Just look at Smotown's complete lore series that is currently running at over 37 hours. <laughs> Holy fuck, this guy is a beast. But I don't need 37 hours to explain the lore to you. I've watched all of Game of Thrones, and I've read all of A Song of Ice and Fire. I know how that lazy bastard George's mind works, and everything I say will be 100% correct fact, with zero lies or misinterpretations. Trust me. So allow me to tell you the tale of the Elden Ring and the lands between. Okay, so, first off, what the hell even is an Elden Ring? Well, it's a collection of runes of power, which define the laws of reality in the lands between, essentially the blueprint of the game's world. The Elden Ring was sent to the lands between from outer space on a star, aka the Elden Beast, by a mysterious godlike entity only known as the Greater Will. Elden Ring has a lot of mystery surrounding its cosmology, and it's super cool. All sorceries seemingly draw power from the stars, and some bosses like Estelle and the Falling Star Beast come from space, making them literal aliens in this fantasy world. But anyway, Greater William here is an outer god, mysterious beings that seem to exist outside of the game's reality, and the Greater Will is just one of many gods, as there's also an outer god of rot, blood, a fire god of the giants, and others that are alluded to, but we know very little about these other gods. These gods are powerful, but they apparently can't interact directly with the world, so they seemingly need a vessel or a host to interact with the world on their behalf. And the vessel for the Elden Ring is Queen Merica herself, a mysterious woman and the origin point of pretty much everything in the story. Once Queen Merica was ringed up, she removed the Rune of Death and gave it to her wolf servant Malekith, and established her Golden Order, which is symbolized by the massive glowing Ur tree that you can see from anywhere in the game which bestowed its grace on the people of the lands between, who worshipped the tree and Merica herself. But with death removed from the Elden Ring, the people of the lands between no longer died naturally, and rather had to drag their emaciated bodies into the roots of the Ur tree to be absorbed, which looks fucking nasty. I'd rather shrivel up and die of aging rather than getting freaky in these Ur tree roots. Or they would get turned into meat soup after getting placed into a living jar, which were used to feed the smaller minor Ur trees all over the land. Fucking disgusting. Anyway, this new Golden Order was cool and all, but then thousands of fire giants in the northern mountains who worship a completely different god were like, Whoa, whoa, whoa. We ain't gonna worship that massive piss tree. So Merica, fearing that the giant god's eternal flame may threaten to burn down the earth tree, wink wink, launched a preemptive war on the giants, and her armies were led by her husband and the first Elden Lord, Godfrey. Godfrey was an incredibly powerful warrior. So powerful that he needed to take on a bisected spectral lion on his back just to contain his gamer rage and thirst for battle, and was chosen as Elden Lord for his strength. Being an Elden Lord essentially means that you are the consort to the vessel for the Elden Ring, so piping the Elden Ring makes you Lord. Simple as. But if that's the case, was Godfrey also piping the Elden Beast when he was doing his duty? Was he literally out there dishing out devious beast shots? I don't know man, I gotta get my mind out of the gutter. Anyway, Godfrey and the armies of the Ur Tree decimated the giants, and Merica had even killed their flame god, 
leaving only one giant left alive to tend to their inextinguishable flame for the rest of eternity. Damn, tough scene. America is one cruel bitch, goddamn. But I respect it. America then went on to have at least three children with Godfrey, Godwin the Golden, the first and most beloved of the demigods, and the Omen twins, Morgoth and Moog. Omens being a sort of magical defect that can occur with human births, where the babies are born with gray skin, monstrous builds, and horns growing all over their bodies. Now back in the trad days before the Erd Tree, there was something called the Crucible, a sort of wellspring slash font that life endlessly sprang from. Life created by the Crucible was chaotic, creating lots of hybrid creatures like the Demi-Humans, the Misbegotten, and the Omens, them being humanoids with animalistic features like wings, lizard tails, scales, and so on. However, in this new woke era of the Erd Tree, order and perfection were valued over vitality and natural growth, and Crucible-born creatures were seen as cursed monsters. And as such, Morgoth and Moog were thrown into a dingy sewer to live out their days away from the golden light of the Erd Tree's grace. Damn, another tough scene. But they're the lucky ones, as non-royal omen babies just have their horns surgically excised, which usually ends up killing them. That's tough. However, once Merica had secured her golden authority and all of her enemies had been defeated by Godfrey and his armies, she did him dirty, divorcing him, taking away his grace and the grace of his followers, and banished them from the lands between where they became known as the Tarnished, tarnished by the fact that their grace had been divested. Merica then married a mysterious red-haired beefcake named Radigan, who had left his wife Renala, a powerful glintstone sorcerer, and the queen of the Karian royal family that controlled the Liurnia region of the map. And together, they had three children, Rikard, Radon, and Rani, and Radagon's sudden departure emotionally crippled Queen Renala, leaving her completely despondent and neutered the Karian's power from the inside. Once they were hitched, Merica and Radagon had even more children, Two, in fact. Melania, the current vessel of the outer god of Rot, and Mikola, a mysterious eternal child demigod, and seemingly the most intelligent or magically gifted demigod of them all. However, Turtle Pope here tells us that Merica and Radagon have a skeleton in their closet. Two, actually, as Radagon and Merica are actually the same person. It's unclear if this was always the case, or if at some point they had become fused together, but they both share the same body, as in the final boss battle, Merica's crusty, cracked up body morphs into Radagon's crusty, ashy body. And you can even see Merica's hair change from blonde to red in the teaser trailer for Elden Ring. It's pretty subtle, but it's a great detail. Now, I'm not exactly sure how they managed to fuck with only one body, but weirder things have happened, I suppose. Regardless, this Golden Order lasted for an unknown amount of time, anywhere from a few hundred to several thousands of years, and many more demigods came and went. But outside of Godric and his identical twin Godefroy, who were born much later than any of the other demigods I just mentioned. We don't know their names. Eventually, the demigod Rani, who is an Empyrean, someone who meets the requirements to become the next god and succeed Merica, decided that she wasn't really rocking with this strange human flesh devouring golden tree god and his weird psychic hairy finger monster servants, and she conspired to free herself of the two fingers and the greater will. She stole a fragment of the rune of death from under Malachis' nose, hired the black knife assassins, and imbued their daggers with death itself, and send them to go kill a demigod. Rani also killed her physical form, but kept her spirit alive, and placed it in her new doll body we all know and love. Godwin was killed by the assassins, and they carved up his shit real bad. <sighs> Ouch. Which did the opposite of Rani, killing his spirit, but not his body, which would eventually cause his body to grow into this massive fleshy fish-like monster thing. Seriously, what the fuck am I looking at? And it embedded itself in the roots of the Ur tree, spreading death root and raising skeleton zombies from the dead and corrupting the very land itself with his fleshy, stingray, coochie-eyed face. Merica was distraught by the loss of her first and most beloved son, and made a bit of an unwise move, shattering the Elden Ring itself, which led to her and Radigan getting imprisoned inside the Earth Tree, and causing the lands between to fall into absolute chaos. The demigods tried to consolidate their power by gathering up fragments of great runes from the Shattering, and wars broke out between them to determine who shall become the next Elden Lord. Dell was sieged, Morgoth impaled Radan with his walking stick at some point, Shit was just out of hand. However, no demigod would come out on top, and the lands between remained locked in a stalemate between them, where they and the land itself both rotted away and fell to ruins. However, all hope is not lost, as the Tarnished, who had lived and died for generations outside of the lands between, had suddenly been given their grace back, and were raised from the dead, and were being drawn back to gather up the great runes and to restore the Elden Ring and the lands between, which is where we the player come in, a newly arrived Tarnished warrior to the lands between. We are now the final hope for this godforsaken land. Some homeless guy with a sword, or two, 
And this lore dump I just gave you is the bare minimum knowledge needed to understand where you're going and who you'll be fighting in-game. And this is just scratching the surface. Elden Ring's lore is very layered and endlessly interesting. And like its forefathers, it's told masterfully through subtle clues, weapon descriptions, and the design of the world's statues, architecture, and the very land itself. It's like trying to read a history textbook with 80% of the pages ripped out, giving us just enough information to dig into and make hours of theory and speculation videos, but leaves out enough to keep the mystery and the history of the lands between endlessly fascinating. It's FromSoft's densest world and lore yet, and there's still so much we know little about, like the pre urtree times, the Crucible, the ancient dragons and their own Elden Lord Placidusax, the Godskin Apostasy, the ancient rites of death, the stars and creatures from outer space like Estelle, and even if whether or not the big glowing Erd tree is just an illusion, it's all pretty awesome stuff, and hopefully we can learn more in the DLC. Beanin. But now let's move on to gameplay. An Elden Ring can be sort of described as Dark Souls 3 too. It takes the gameplay from Dark Souls 3 as a skeleton. You have your classic red health, blue magic, and green stamina juice bars. You rest at bonfire, I mean sites of grace. You have a dodge roll. You kill enemies to gather souls, I mean runes, to level up. And weapons are locked behind skill requirements. And these skills, strength, dexterity, faith, arcane, and intelligence, all exist to add stat-based damage to your weapons, based on its scaling, which are denoted by these letter grade rankings, and to act as checks to prohibit weapon usage until you get the required skills. Otherwise, that glowing sword of pure lethal grace turns into a sticky hand right before your very eyes. All because you don't have enough faith. It then takes all these pre-established souls mechanics and expands on them in a bevy of ways. You can now jump with a dedicated jump button, and no longer have to get a running start. Double tap the left joystick to launch yourself forward into the air, and hope and pray that you stick the landing and don't somersault into a pit because your jump angle is off by 3 degrees. Being able to easily jump impacts the gameplay quite a bit, as there are now way more platforming opportunities. You can dodge many attacks with a well-timed jump, sprint and jump together for longer airtime, and you can use both light and heavy jump attacks for some slower, but more powerful hits. And jump attacks are great for building up staggers on bosses. And jump attacking quickly became my favorite method of attack. It just feels so incredibly satisfying to pound enemies into the dirt with a running jump slam. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Great addition. Another big change is the Ash of War and Weapon Skill System, special attacks you can obtain and put on weapons to further diversify your bag of attacks. And this new system fucking rules. It's super fun to find new weapons and see what Ashes of War they have, especially the legendary and boss weapons that have those real flashy attacks. It's some great stuff, although those special skills are exclusive to their respective special weapons, and other normal weapons have more common Ash of War moves, like Sword Spin or Unsheath. And you can swap Weapon Ashes of War if applicable. Say you don't like your current Stomp Ash? Well then just swap it out for Bloody Slash and mutilate the entire mid-game. It just adds more options in combat for the player at the cost of some FP, and they can do some serious work for you. Some of these ashes are incredibly powerful, like the Bloody Slash I mentioned that you can get in Limgrave, and you can also buy them from certain NPCs, or find them by killing glowing white dung beetles. Why does the poop ball have a special attack in it? There are now also spirit ashes as well. FromSoft sanctioned summons that you can obtain like items, that you can instantly summon for help if you have enough FP to summon one and they can be upgraded by using Glove Wart, which you can find in Catacomb Dungeons or Underground. And they're just friendly AIs, but they're great additions for inexperienced players who might need a little help in some fights. I personally never use these summons, outside of one very specific instance, as I prefer to always fight one-on-one, -on -one. but it's still a pretty good addition regardless. It just gives players more options to succeed. And there are also some smaller additions like the Flask of Wondrous Physic, an alternate flask that you can load up with two modifiers called Tears that have different effects like health regeneration, attack defense, elemental resistance, and so on. And I didn't really use it in my kit too much though, mostly existing for me as an emergency flask, but it's still a decent addition. It just gives the player more options. There's also item crafting, which is required for any open world game, as declared in Skyrim's 2011 mandate for open world games. Article 5. Thou shalt not have an open world without a system to perform item crafting. I rarely use this system though, and I didn't even buy the crafting kit until I was like two-thirds of the way through the game. And the crafting is mostly for making throwables, weapon greases, or consumables. And most importantly, pickled fowl feet. Eat a bird's foot to find more items. What's the lore behind that? You also have a new type of rare item called Stone Sword Keys, which are used to unlock different areas all over the lands between. Usually needed to open up an Everjail to fight a boss in, or a side room in a dungeon to obtain items from. 
or in some cases, entire dungeons. It's kind of like those fragrant branches of yore from Dark Souls 2, which was, no joke, one of the dumbest mechanics in the entire Souls series, at least in Scholar. But in Elden Ring, they aren't required for progression at all like in DS2, and act more as a sort of risk and reward player choice, rather than just being inconveniences. Do you roll the dice and burn a key in the hopes that it'll give you a sick weapon or talisman? It's up to you to decide. And it's a much better implementation than in the past. But with the character interaction additions aside, we can talk about Elden Ring's biggest change, its open world. Did you know that Elden Ring is an open world? Did you know that? Now, an open world isn't anything new, especially in 2022, but FromSoft aren't normal, so their open world has a bit more nuance than your average, I don't know, French video game company that starts with you open world. Rather than being a massive swath of land that resembles the geography of eastern Colorado, Elden Ring's world, despite being decently large, is still very tightly designed, and a lot of exploration will be you trying to reach certain areas of the map and figuring out how to get up and around the massive towering cliffs and ravines that make up the lands between. This place is pretty unique, and the whole map is in the rough shape of a furled finger, and the design of the geography of the place feels almost impossibly otherworldly. Massive cliffs tower out of the ground, creating some pretty striking vistas, as we can see castles and palaces placed on these massive pillars of rock towering over the land. The geography of the land itself much like the Elden Ring, looks shattered and impossible, and stark cliffs are everywhere, and it seems like it would be a massive pain in the ass to travel anywhere around here, constantly having to go up and down and over the crazy geography of the place. You start in Limgrave, a fairly verdant region that's dotted with these massive fallen ruins, in which you then move on to Liernia, a blue-toned watery area that's full of destroyed towns and cliffs, and the majestic academy of Rhea Lucaria lording over the place. There's also Kaelid in the Dragon Barrow, the red rotting shithole that's encrusted in amazingly disgusting rock growths, enemies that are infected with divine STDs, and massive rotting skeletons? What the fuck are these things? There's also the Altus Plateau in Lane Dell, the golden lands of the Golden Order and its magnificent city that you can explore most of. There's also Mount Gelmir, a jagged and hugely vertical area that holds the Volcano Manor, and beyond to the north lies the snow-covered mountaintops of the Giants and the consecrated snowfield which feels slightly empty, despite some pretty great visual design with the snowed over and impaled giant corpses. And those are just the main overworld areas that you can get a map for, as there's also Mikola's Halig Tree, Crumbling Farah Missoula, and the Siofra and Einsel River underground areas that have their own Blackreach-esque moment of discovery. Except it's even better, as you first access the underground by taking a magical elevator in this unassuming building in the woods, only to find out that shit is way bigger and goes way deeper than you ever expected. And on a first time playthrough, this moment is incredible, and is helped greatly by the fantastic design of the underground, which has massive gothic eternal cities that are lying dormant beneath subterranean stars. It's just so amazingly fire. And unlike Blackreach, there's actually shit to do down here besides pulling weeds and getting jumped by Falmer kill squads. And beyond those areas are the Deep Root Depths, Mogwin Palace, and all the legacy and normal dungeons that are all over the lands between. You'll be busy for a bit. And side note, I also really like how you sort of ascend higher and higher into the sky as you progress further into the game's map. It's like you're ascending to godhood, literally. Like I mentioned earlier, the world isn't super huge, and you may be limited by cliffs and barriers that you need to reach through backtracking or obtaining certain items. And each major area of the map almost feels like an expanded Dark Souls area, as the devs clearly put a lot of clever and meaningful design choices into these areas, instead of it just being a massive open swath with a thousand different little objectives to go collect. And this approach to open world design only helps the game, as although the overall real estate to fuck around in is smaller, it removes downtime from traveling long distances, and it allows the devs to make the world as dense and tight as possible, making exploration almost always interesting, as you almost never go even a minute without something to fight, a field boss to slay, a place to explore, a cliff to climb, or an item to loot. It's an open world with almost all the fat of an open world trimmed off of it, and it works great. There's almost never that classic open world moment where you're just beelining it to the floating objective marker that's two kilometers away from you, all the while you're half asleep scrolling zitter for some hilarious zeets while you're not even paying attention to the game, which is an achievement unto itself. However, even Elden Ring has its limits, and as you play on, the world definitely loses its mystique a bit, as new enemies and bosses appear more and more infrequently, and the same bosses and enemy types start reappearing. And it's not quite as exciting when you're in the consecrated snowfield exploring caves, and you find out that the boss is just round six with the Leonine Misbegotten. Now, I get it. This is a huge game, and it's From's first swing at the setting. So some copying and pasting is in order to pad out and fill out all the nooks and crannies of the game world. And I personally don't mind fighting the same boss multiple times. Most of the bosses here usually have robust enough movesets to keep rematches fun and dangerous. But it does fall flat at times, looking at Gankskin Duo. 
and I understand why the repeated content in the later half of the game is disappointing for many. And like I mentioned before, once past Lane Dell, the mountaintops of the Giants, and especially the consecrated snowfield, feel noticeably emptier than previous areas, which is disappointing because of how big the place looks on the map. You open it up to see this huge area, only to realize it's only half as dense as Kalid, if that. But besides the world of the lands between running out of steam a bit in the endgame, the world is tight, vertical, dangerous, and beautifully striking, and it really stands out amongst a sea of vaguely mountainous looking maps of other open world games. Elden Ring also has a fully static and carefully designed world, and thank god for it. No more uniform scaling, please, we need to kill that concept from open world games entirely. What I mean by this is that the world is the exact same from beginning to end, and each enemy and boss are, well, mostly, carefully designed and scaled around the player's progression through the game. And you may overlook and ignore certain dungeons or bosses, and when you come back later, you can absolutely dog walk the boss with your high level character. It gives the game a strong sense of progression, and you can clearly see how strong you've gotten by just going back and fodderizing a boss you may have missed, or finally getting your lick back against the boss that was too much for you on your first encounter. It gives the players complete freedom on how to explore and conquer their world, and no two Elden Ring playthroughs will be exactly alike. Each player will have different struggles and successes against different bosses, and although they'll eventually kill all the same bosses, the journey is different each time. And on top of the open world, there's also a huge amount of dungeons, which can be caves, mines, catacombs, hero graves, sorcerer rises, and ruins. And although each type of dungeon is kinda samey, they all serve a distinct purpose. Mines and caves are great places to find smithing stones, catacombs are full of glove wart and usually drop a spirit ash when you beat the boss, and hero graves are harder and more complex, fuck these chariots by the way, but usually have better items and armors to find. And the ruins always have exactly one basement you can pilfer for all types of rewards. And sorcerer towers usually have you solving a puzzle to gain entry. And they usually give you a memory stone for more spell slots for your trouble. Their fun side objective is to clear out, and some of these places can be pretty well hidden, so it's extra satisfying to find one wholly on your own. And they all feel like complete side objectives. You even fight a boss at the end of each one. It's all pretty good shit, and my only real complaints revolve around the relative sameness of the area types. All catacombs and caves look about the same, for example, and the bosses they contain can be pretty underwhelming when it's just an average enemy that's been promoted to a boss, or if it's a repeat of a boss you've already fought. But hey, when the game has 238 bosses, they all can't be gems. Lastly, there are also the legacy dungeons, where the juiciest bosses live, and where the game is most similar to its soul's forefathers. These places being Stormvale Castle, Ray Lucaria Academy, Volcano Manor, Lane Dell, Crumbling Faro Missoula, and the Halic Tree. And there are other smaller castles like Redmain Castle, Castle Soul, Castle Morn, and the Shaded Castle, and more which are probably half the size of the Legacy Dungeons. The Legacy Dungeons themselves are around the size of any given previous Souls level, maybe a little bit smaller. They're around the same size as the High Wall of Lothric, or the Grand Archives, for example. And each of these dungeons are all distinct and unique from each other, and all have a Shard Bearer boss, and you snatch that Shard from them once you defeat them. But you can't use it until you climb one of the huge Divine Towers and restore its power at the top. And once activated, you can use a Rune Arc to activate your Shard, much like Embering in Dark Souls 3 but I rarely use the great runes. I simply didn't need them, really. Also, the rune arcs are an expendable resource, and I never know when I might actually need them. For real this time. Finally, since we're in an open world, we need a way to quickly get around. And luckily for us, we get a FromSoft first, a mount named Torrent, a pudgy goat horse thing. Oh, ain't he cute. Torrent is a great addition. He's got a fun double jump you can use for some crusty platforming. And you can fight on Torrent back by pressing the left and right bumpers and triggers to attack on each respective side of Torrent. Although the mounted combat is pretty bare bones, as you can only do said swings, keeping combat pretty basic outside of mastering the positioning of that drive-by swing perfectly, or jumping up to pimp slap a dragon on its head. My only issue with Torrent is that his big jumps can sometimes end up getting you killed if you take too big of a fall, and he falls so slowly and peacefully. I got surprised a few times after realizing I misjudged my fall, and the game loudly kills me from the impact. But besides that, this is the best goat horse creature a Tarnish could ask for. NPC quests are back, and they're bigger and just as obtuse as ever. And these quests are the main method of getting one of the five alternate endings Elden Ring has beyond just killing the Elden Beast and Radigan. Those being Ronnie's questline, Fia's questline, Goldmask questline, the fucking shit eaters questline, and the frenzied flame questline. And these main quests are on top of a bunch of smaller side quests you can stumble upon, like Millicent's quest, the Castle Morin quest, Dialysis quest, Alexander the Warrior Jar's quest, and so much more. But, I'll be upfront. 
I've only done Ronnie's questline, and even then I needed some help from Google Gamers to help me out in a few spots, especially having to spam talk to the mini Ronnie to progress her quest. I'm pure dog ass at following FromSoft quest, and I usually ignore them, as I'll be so focused on reaching and preparing for the next boss battle, I forget to progress a quest step, and then boom, that's the entire save cooked. But luckily for my ignorant ass, Elden Ring is totally cool with you doing that. Many of the main quests coincide with taking down bosses, getting specific items, and progressing through the game normally. It can be sort of boiled down to just talking to the right character at the right time. Like in Ronnie's quest, to progress it, you need to kill Radon, and just talk to Ronnie before and after the fight to move her quest along, and all the other steps of her quest can be done independently of it, like finding and killing Estelle, and reaching the Moonlight Altar Plateau area. They're completely optional and extremely missable but they're just there to provide extra stories and experiences to reward those who take the time to dig deep and seek out the quests. And it's not too different from past FromSoft quest structures and execution, and I have no issues with them much at all. Nice work. And from here, you'll be doing your Elden thing, exploring on your funny looking horse goat thing, looting items, killing enemies and bosses, leveling up with runes, clearing dungeons, finding sites of grace and all that good shit. It's an expanded and freer souls experience, and you're free to build any character you want, and Elden Ring is at its absolute best when you're coming up with new builds and gear combinations. There are 308 weapons across 31 different weapon types, and each weapon type has a unique feel and pace to their combat. Anything from simple daggers to swords made from the body of a god. There's a ton of shit to play around with and obliterate your enemies with. And the game also comes with spells and incantations for magically minded builds, with 70 sorceries and 101 incantations for the player to collect and use. And Elden Ring is the first FromSoft game that made me actually want to use magic in some capacity, as I always saw it as an irrelevant niche form of attack in the Souls games. And now they're even some of the strongest and safest methods of attack. You cast sorceries with a glintstone staff, and cast incantations with seals. You can combine these physical weapons with these incantations and spells for an effectively endless combination of loadouts. You can cast incantations or spells in your offhand, and use your weapon in the other. Or you can two-hand weapons, dual-wield weapons of the same type in a power stance, cast only spells and incantations, do whatever you like. It's fantastic. And all the weapons feel great to use. From Software, in my opinion, still has the best third-person melee combat in all of gaming at the moment. And Elden Ring is their best combat system to date. It's just so damn satisfying and fun to play. Every strike, jump attack, perfectly timed dodge, and backstab feels so good. And hearing that loud slicing noise when you kill an enemy is just sublime. The game retains that unique combat flow that FromSoft are masters at. And when the combat is firing in all cylinders, I enter this almost flow state, where the game starts feeling more like a rhythm game more than anything, and you become one with the boss, reading every move and punishing every opening. It's hard to describe, but any Souls vet can understand this rhythmic nature of the combat I'm talking about. It's just so good. And these same technical and mechanical upgrades go for the enemies as well, and they're more robust, stronger, faster, more varied, and more complex than any Souls game before them. And some of these bastards are actual demons from the depths of hell, who exist only to torment you. Whoever designed the Rune Bear and the Royal Revenant, I hope you fucking get many wonderful blessings in your life. Furthermore, the game's design highly incentivizes weapon and build experimentation, as once you beat the shit out of this depressed, divorced single mother, she will allow you to respec your levels as long as you have a larval tier, which you find a solid supply of throughout your playthrough, so go nuts on trying out new builds. You'll just need some smithing stones or somber smithing stones to get your new weapons up to speed on damage. And you can clear mines for large amounts of stones. And you can collect smithing stone bell bearings to get an infinitely buyable supply at the round table holds twin maiden husk vendor. Although the implementation of smithing stones is a bit odd, as normal, unremarkable weapons need smithing stones, whereas boss and unique weapons need somber smithing stones to be upgraded. But these unremarkable normal weapons need 12 smithing stones of each tier to increase their power. And the special weapons only need one somber stone for each tier. And somber stones and their bell bearings are just as easy to find as the regular smithing stones, making these specialty god weapons ironically easier to upgrade and swap between than the bog standard weapons. This could be easily balanced if they just reduce the amount of normal smithing stones needed per upgrade. As without the bell bearings, it's actually pretty tough to gather up 12 of each smithing stone tier to make sure you're at your strongest. And this goes against Elden Ring's strengths of being able to try out new weapons and builds quickly, and it actively de-incentivizes you from changing your equipped weapons until late in the game, when you have all the bell bearings and a stockpile of stones and runes, when I feel like it should be the opposite. But regardless, I have almost no complaints about the combat system, minus some confusing hitboxes, which mostly come from area of effect attacks. Late game bosses like Dragonlord Placidusax, Radigan, and the Cardio Beast have a lot of massive area of effects, and it's pretty hard to judge the dodge timing on these explosions, as well as which attacks can be jumped or rolled. 
Placidu Sax's Flying Claw Slam leaves a huge AoE that I can only dodge effectively around half of the time, and Radigan's attack areas make his dodge windows insanely tight, and led to a few hits I was a little annoyed at, as I could have sworn I had the perfect timing, only to get hit on the fringe of an explosion's area. But besides this AoE chicanery, this is the gold standard for third person melee combat. It doesn't get better than this. Anyway, next up, difficulty. Yeah, no surprise, Elden Ring is hard. It's the 2020s, it's a FromSoft game, we all know how this goes. But ironically, it's also one of their easiest games, as you have way more options and support at your disposal to help you succeed. And in reality, Elden Ring will end up being as hard as you make it. I'm a firm believer that anyone of any skill level can get good at Souls-like combat. Anyone from a DoorDash residue encrusted professional gamer like XQC, to your technologically illiterate grandma who hasn't touched a joystick since the Atari 2600 was on store shelves, can master this game. It just takes time and dedication, like most other skill-based activities. And Elden Ring is probably the best place to start for people new to the FromSoft formula of games, as all these previously mentioned additions, like the Spirit Ashes and the Ashes of War, are just here to empower you to take down those bosses that are pounding your ass into the dirt. In fact, it's so player-friendly, even Elon Musk, whose build was so horrendously offensive he should see jail time for it, and I'm not kidding, can not only survive, but thrive in the lands between. Here's a video of a guy using his build to take down Melania, and he obliterates her. However, Elden Ring's late game, which I consider to be around when you reach the mountaintops of the giants, is an absolute dick. The difficulty curve of Elden Ring looks something like this. Enemies start hitting like absolute trucks, and the bosses start getting really powerful, forcing you to vigor up and really max out your gear to get through the endgame boss death gauntlet if you're going one-on-one -on -one with these guys. However, that's just one way to take these guys on, and if you want to beat them with less, you know, death and suffering. You can always just exploit a broken build like the 10 second combat is Zerb Blast to fire your laser all the way to the Elden Throne. I'm a fire in my laser! <laughs> or use one or several powerful spirit ashes to give yourself an unfair advantage. Who's ganking who now, bitch? Or you can just use some old fashioned traditional souls player summoning. You have plenty of options to make the game as easy for you as possible. And Elden Ring is designed with the usage of these mechanics in mind. Yes, bosses like Melania are broken. And that's by design. I'm pretty sure her waterfowl dance attack is literally undodgeable if you're not far enough away from her, or if you're not using Bloodhound Step. Her health regen on hit for a boss that thrives off lightning fast strikes is certainly a choice. And if you beat her one-on-one, -on -one, and God bless you if you do, you're a bigger man than me, you're still very likely exploiting something to win, like using the aforementioned Bloodhound Step to get around the waterfowl dance, or taking advantage of bleed buildup or heavy weapon staggering to exploit her weak poise and to build up extra damage. And in this moment, the game is telling you, hey, you might want to call in some backup here. You can still beat every single boss in the game one-on-one -on -one if you want. Don't get it twisted. But the game isn't playing fair in its attempts to murder you. And it's designed to have you play dirty and return to overcome some of these bosses. And sure, there's still Elden Ring gods out there who can destroy Melania without any exploits. But 9 out of 10 players don't have the time, nor the patience, to try hundreds of attempts trying to take down this boss one-on-one. -on -one. If you're really itching for those tightly balanced boss battles that are perfectly tuned for a 1v1 between your character and whatever monstrosity Miyazaki and the boys created to eviscerate you, you'll be a bit let down by Elden Ring. This is late game Elden Ring, bitch. There's no fairness here. Now eat this undodgeable blood blast countdown. But hey, it isn't all bad. Outside of these more unfairly designed bosses, the rest of the bosses here are pretty great and some of From Software's best work. Morgoth, Godfrey, Moog, and even Malekith Minus that slash ball attack he does, fuck that shit, are some of my favorite boss battles from software has ever made. They're more dynamic, deadly, and unpredictable than ever. Seriously, some of these attack delays are brutal. And these guys would bait me to dodge so early I'd often dodge roll once or twice before they even finished their attack windup. So you gotta invest a solid amount of time getting whacked by these bosses, learning all their moves and timings, as a lot of bosses slowly wind up, then attack so fast it's almost impossible to properly react so getting a good feel for their timing is essential. You're cooked without the proper mastery of the boss timings and how to evade their more devastating moves. And each boss from here on out has some form of massive explosion or grab that can make your health bar disappear in an instant. Bosses have also gotten a huge boon in the form of America stakes, temporary sites of grace that you can spawn at, but can't rest at. And they're usually placed right near most bosses, effectively killing boss runs as a whole. And this is a very good change as it removes a lot of the potential fat of the game of hauling your ass back to the boss over and over again, and lets you quickly jump right back into a fight. As without them, you'd be losing a ton of playtime running back to square up to one of the 200 plus bosses in the game, and that's time you're never getting back. Although I'd be lying if I don't miss the boss runs just a little bit, as a Soul Series veteran. But I think it's ultimately a change for the better, 
that values the player's time over all else, and it's presented in a pretty natural way in-universe. You also gotta remember, Miyazaki wasn't the only director on this game. The Dark Souls 2 director worked on this too, and I played Crown of the Iron King. Do not let this man Tanimura cook! Also, the big boy bosses in this game, called the Remembrance Bosses, drop said remembrances that you can exchange with the finger reader crone at the round table hole for boss items and weapons, much like Dark Souls 3's soul transposing system. And I love that system in Dark Souls 3, and I love it here too. And you can even duplicate the remembrances in these walking mausoleums, and these things are just so damn cool. I love the massive DONGs they let off with each step, and they look really imposing out in the open world. And to access them, you gotta give it a manicure and break a bunch of scully barnacles on the legs of it. It just makes the remembrance system better in almost every way. But speaking of bosses, what's an Elden Ring video without an arbitrary boss ranking? Now, ranking the Elden Ring bosses is a bit tricky, as all 238 enemies considered bosses in the game aren't all unique encounters, and there's a lot of repeated bosses. And I mean a lot of them. More powerful versions of the same bosses, normal enemies who are given health bars, and so on. So, some ground rules are in order. Rule number one, generic slash late game enemies that have been given boss health bars don't count unless stated otherwise. No Patrick, Beastman of Faramazula, and Stone Digger Troll are not actual bosses. Rule number two, if the boss is repeated or has multiple versions, like Phantom Godfrey versus the full Godfrey slash Horalu fight, I'll only discuss the more powerful version of the boss, as these weaker bosses are usually just the first phase of the full fight. Rule number three, if the boss is indeed a repeated enemy boss type, I'll only count it if the boss is required either to complete the game or to access other bosses, like Margit or the Red Wolf of Radigan, despite the former being a weaker version of the full fight later and the latter being an upgraded enemy boss. And rule number four, if bosses are extremely similar, I'll group them together and count them as one entry. For example, Fortisax and Landsax, the Crucible Knights, all the Erdtree Avatars, Knights Cavalry, Deathbirds, Flying Dragons, so on and so forth. They're all coming together for one boss. This list is just my opinion and is ranked based on my own personal enjoyment of each fight. You probably won't agree with it, and that's totally fine. And feel free to share your own thoughts and rankings, or give me a verbal lashing for my dogshit gamer opinions. But all right, no more fucking around. Let's get started with the worst boss, the... What the fuck were they thinking? Simply the worst boss in the game, hands down. In a seemingly vain attempt to recapture the magic of the Ornstein and Smo skinny guy fat guy double battle, the boss we are required to kill before taking on Malachus shoves us in a room with a godskin noble and apostle. Two bosses whose movesets don't complement each other whatsoever, making the fight a drawn out slog where you bait one to attack you, fight it, and try to dodge and manage the other's attacks, with the godskins trading aggro every so often. Not only that, the boss fucking lies to you, as it's more of a godskin trio and a half, and if you defeat one, the other will respawn it not too long after, and you defeat the boss by draining the health bar fully, not just slaying the two godskins. Just breaking the boss fight into two health bars for the Apostle and Noble would have been a better choice in my opinion, but that still wouldn't save it much. It's seemingly thrown together, and it's simply not a very fun battle. D tier. It's Gang Squad Reborn, but at least they're way weaker this time, and they have an actual structure to the fight, as you fight a ghostly NPC champion first, then Rogier, then Lionel the Lionhearted, this game's funny fat armor guy, alongside two other champions. They're effectively no different than any given NPC invader, and you can deal with them as such. It's hardly a boss, more like a combat trial more than anything, and you'll cut through these guys with little trouble. C tier. Definitely my least favorite Remembrance boss. Fire Giant has some incredible size and spectacle to him, and I'm pretty sure he's the largest From Software boss that isn't limited to being stuck in one place like the Dragon God, and by tarnish only reaches up to about his ankle. But this size is the only thing he's really got going for him, as the rest of the fight is a total slog. Fire Giant is an absolute ocean of health, and you can only do significant damage by hitting his rod ankle weak spot, or in his second phase, his chest and his meaty wrists, which you barely get the chance to hit, as they're out of reach most of the time. His attacks are massive, but slow, so once you learn his movesets, the fight is just a slow grind of slicing up his feet and ankles until you reach his second form, where he then awakens his fell god visage on his chest in a really cool and brutal cutscene, where he tears off his broken leg and sacrifices it. Damn, that's tough. But I respect it. And he starts using super powerful pyromancies, which can deal massive explosive damage if you aren't careful. And you sure as hell don't want to have to redo the entire fight because a firebomb nuked your health bar. It's slow, careful, and heavily punishes the player with flame pyromancies that can end your run off just one mistake. Just not really a fan of this one, to be honest. C tier. A weak but endlessly annoying boss who zips around the arena teleporting into black clouds, who then quickly reappears to unleash a flurry of attacks. 
I'm not sure if I'm just a scrub or what, but this guy was giving me conniptions for a while as I whiffed attacks, and he teleported right into a multi-hit combo to obliterate me. And his shadowy design made it hard for me to see him as well. But the design itself is really cool. He's a gaunt, wholly black and shadowy humanoid with some bug-looking parasite stuck to his head. He looks like he'd be right at home at Bloodborne. Some Witch of Hemwick shade-looking dude. It's okay. C tier. I absolutely love the design of this guy. He's a skeleton boatman with a horn to summon skeletons to fight alongside him, and he attacks using his boat itself. And I love dodging the massive boat blasts and watching him boat around the arena, but I can't place him any higher than this because he's simply too easy. He's incredibly slow, passive, and pretty weak overall, even on his massive boat wave slam, which is incredibly slow and easy to dodge. And he mostly relies on his summon skeletons to keep you occupied, as if you get too close to him, you can pretty much just wail on him endlessly. I love the design, but he's just way too easy. C tier. It's a, what the fuck is even happening, boss if I've ever fought one. And the illustrated tree spirit is this massive fleshy tree serpent thing that's been snorting way too much Miranda powder. Despite his size, he can move extremely quickly and has some huge flying moves. And I really like his one move where he hops up into the air, hangs for a bit, and then closes in with a huge flying bite attack. And dodging that attack is always so visually and mechanically satisfying to pull off. But his massive size and speed make the fight crusty as hell, as the game has a hard time keeping up with the damn thing and its erratic movements. And when closing into attack, you lose sight of its entire model, making incoming attacks pretty hard to see. It's still a pretty fun fight overall, but its camera issues and the high speed of the fight make it a total clusterfuck. C tier. Well, of course I know him. He's me. Who doesn't love a good mirror match, huh? Well, me. I only like them, at best. Mimic tier copies your character stats and gear, and forces you to overcome your own build. And it was not fun to have that bloody slash thrown back in my face. But despite this unique setup, it's just your standard human NPC fight. Room temperature, AI, and all. And you can take down Mimic tier as you would any other invader. It's alright. It's not subtle or nuanced. But it's alright. C tier. I knew you'd come. The all-knowing who really doesn't know shit. Seriously. Bro didn't know where Mikola and Moog were. He didn't know how to obtain the Halleck Tree medallions. He doesn't know what America's plans are at all, nor how to become Elden Lord. He has no feats, and has never obtained a single great rune in his untold years of running the Round Table Hole. And worst of all, he uses a fucking magic build. More like Gideon Fraudnir. <laughs> anyway, Gideon has a war chest of powerful sorceries to vaporize you with, and he's constantly trying to separate himself from you so he can use his magical heavy artillery. But at the end of the day, he's still just an enemy human NPC, so his battle can only get so challenging and you can comically obliterate him with an overpowered skill or ash of war if you want. And as long as you don't get double tapped by his glintstone shots or heavy explosions, he goes down pretty quick. No tarnish can become Elden Lord, get the fuck out of here. Gothic horse riders that only appear at, well, night. And there are a ton of these guys. I think there's like 10 of them all across the map. Some devious control C and control v from the devs. They can either wheel flails or halberds, and the rider and the horse have separate health bars. So if you kill the horse, you get to take on the cavalry on foot until he summons another gothic steed. Despite the intimidating all-black armor and their horse covered in a scary black sheet, the knight's cavalry are surprisingly bog-standard rider enemies, swinging their weapons from horseback and having their horse try and slam or buck you occasionally. And they sort of feel like the tree sentinels, without any of the added shield arts or draconic magic moves, making them fairly forgettable and overshadowed by their yellow fellows. C tier. When I met you in the summer. A bit of an exception, as Red Wolves of Radigan start showing up as generic field enemies later on in the game. But you need to defeat this one before you fight Renala. So here he is. Red Wolf of Radigan is an interesting beast fight because he can use glintstone sorceries on top of some pretty flashy sword attacks, and is constantly darting around the arena, giving the fight a pretty breakneck pace. And you'll probably get whacked hard a few times misreading a bite, or getting hit by his incredibly fast glintstone jump shot. But the wolf itself is pretty weak, and I was able to shred his health bar pretty quickly with Bloody Slash and a few jump attacks. Overall, a pretty solid, but forgettable fight. High C tier. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus Christ. Estelle probably has the most unique design of any boss in Elden Ring, as up until you encounter him, you'll be fighting your typical dark fantasy fair, decrepit and massive knights, dragons, and beasts of all shapes and sizes. That is, until you progress through the underground areas and come face to face with this fucking thing. This massive alien winged centipede thing with a hollowed out human face, a massive eye on its forehead, and large bug pinchers. What the fuck? Elden Ring can have a little cosmic horror. For fun. It's another boss design that I love, and everything about his presentation, design, and music is fantastic. But the fight itself is a bit irritating, unfortunately. 
Estelle's weak spot is his head, and hitting his balled up limbs will do some pretty paltry damage. So my strategy was to power bomb his head to win, and most of the fight is you struggling to get your positioning right to whack his head. All the while, his moveset is full of massive get off me moves like his gravity slam and pulsating AoE attacks, his backpedals, and teleportations, solidly dragging out the fight's pace. And his teleport can also be used to cover for a grab attack that will likely one hit KO you if you aren't at full health, and he can appear to grab you from any random angle. And my best strategy to avoid this move was to just spin the camera wildly when he vanishes, then hope you can spot him and react to his grab before he gives you that cosmic chomp. But having to chase after him constantly and him being fairly hard to hit consistently makes this fight unsatisfying for me personally. It's just not one of my favorites. High C tier. Another common field boss, the Flying Dragons has some pretty awesome size to Elden Ring's boss lineup, and there are several versions of this dragon boss, each with unique elemental breaths, like fire, glintstone flame, scarlet rot, ice, and so on. And these breath attacks are by far their best weapons, as I've had many dragon fights end when I got cremated by their flying breath blast moves after getting caught out of position, and these attacks are so powerful, they even damage the frame rate. But besides their massive breaths, these dragons are really no sweat. Their physical attacks are slow stomps, tail swipes, massive bites, and the occasional aerial slam, all of which are very easy to read and react to, making these fights just a slow go of hitting the dragon's ankles and head, and fleeing when the dragon decides to light it up, making the fight slightly unengaging, especially once you've fought multiple dragons, and can get pretty frustrating when you spend several minutes methodically whittling down its health, only to get double tapped by its massive fire breath attacks, making me place them here. High C tier. Another fairly common boss type that appears multiple times in the lands between. Magma worms are these gigantic draconic salamanders who attack with massive lava blasts and slow but powerful sword swings, and they're some pretty tanky bastards. The first phase is straightforward, just dodge his slow jawbone club swings and stay away from the lava pools he spits out, but this phase goes to shit real quick when the worm decides to charge, where he spews lava and chases the player, and he may do this move multiple times in a row. And when you're trying to fight a worm in any semi-enclosed space, it gets pretty annoying, to say the least. And in his second phase, the worm actually stands up, pukes lava all over his sword, and now has some insanely slow, yet devastating attacks, like this huge overhead slam that's not easy to get the dodge timing just right. But juke these haymakers and keep the pressure on, and the salamander will go down no problem. It's a decent battle, but the fairly simplistic and slow moveset, and the sometimes infuriating charge spam they seemingly love to do, makes me put them here. High C tier. Peter, the horse is here. The Elven Ring Noob Slayer. Bless him for that. The Tree Sentinel is probably the first enemy you'll ever see once you take your first steps into Limgrave, and he is a perfect representation of the open world's design philosophy. You can try to take him on right away if you think you got the sauce, but 9 out of 10 players won't stand a chance at the start, forcing you to explore, get stronger, get comfortable, get better items, and come back when you think you're ready. And its implementation is damn near perfect. The actual boss fight itself, however, is nothing too special. He's a rider-type enemy who attacks with massive and fun to dodge halberd swings and some huge shield attacks you gotta watch out for. He's got this poor horse jumping around like it's in the NBA. It's a fun, but pretty straightforward fight that's great for getting used to attack timings and pacing for future battles. Also, the Tree Sentinel has some sick armor. I was rocking the Tree Sentinel set for the entire second half of this playthrough. Damn, I got that shit on. But fuck the gank version of this fight. Yui Tanimura, you dirty bastard. B tier. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> On their own, the gargoyles are some pretty fun and challenging bosses. These lanky bastards probably have the most cursed gargoyle design of all time. They look like they're composed of large rotting corpse parts grafted together. And if you look closely, you can see it has two faces stuck together. Fucking yuck. The gargoyles fight with two weapons that they can swap between, being either a sword and halberd, or an axe and a twin blade. And they will swap between them to change up the fight tempo which I really like, as it keeps the fights varied and dangerous, on top of the pretty fast pace they attack you at, making each gargoyle a pretty dangerous encounter, and each weapon it uses has its own powerful, unique attack. The gargoyle can use its sword to swing wildly at you, use the axe to create huge earthquake AoEs, and the halberd and the twin blade are the worst, as the gargoyle turns into a damn tornado, and puts your ass in a blender if you're even slightly off on your dodges, giving you almost no respite. Each singular gargoyle and black blade kindred encounter is difficult, yeah, really fun, but the Valiant Gargoyles fight in the Aqueduct is some bullshit if I've ever seen it. And it's for one main reason, the poison. Not only do you have to fight two Gargoyles, they now have this massive fuck off poison AoE that has insane reach, and does pretty strong damage just for standing in it, making your character recoil from the poison damage, leaving you extra vulnerable to getting hit by the other Gargoyle, and it's just a total wash. But I still enjoy the singular Gargoyle fights well enough, to make this a B tier. Run. 
the true final boss of the game, and the living embodiment of the Elden Ring itself. Hey, that's the name of the game. And this may very well be the most visually striking boss that FromSoft has ever crafted. Everything about this boss's look and presentation is sublime. The see-through cosmic body of the beast with the golden root looking veins, well, at least I think they're veins, look absolutely fantastic. And the boss arena and music just add even more to the experience. Seeing the other Ur trees towering in the distance give the boss a real sense of mystery and power that seems almost undefeatable. And the attack where he rises into the air is just visually spectacular. It's almost perfect. If only the fight itself was just as good as the presentation. The Elden Beast fight itself is pretty underwhelming and frankly pretty annoying at times. And I feel like I'm running the damn pacer test, rather than throwing hands with the vassal of some unknowable outer god of Golden Order. The beast uses huge incantations and slow sword swings, and most of the fight will have you sprinting around the massive arena trying to avoid the long and massive incantations, and trying to catch up with the beast after it swims away from you. To defeat the cardio beast, you must become like Usain Bolt. How do you dodge its massive ringed explosion attack? Run to the right and jump over the closing hoops to escape. How to avoid its hail of light? Run to the right and don't stop. How to avoid its homing gold ball thing? Run tarnished run. And finally, you have to run right up to him and combo him with that jump slam. And rinse and repeat until his health bar is zero. This battle is clearly much more focused on its spectacle, rather than trying to be a brutally challenging yet satisfying final boss. And although the presentation is literally god tier, I'd still prefer the latter. B tier. The weird, fuzzy faced rock horse thing from outer space will have you feeling like an actual matador, as it'll charge you down, buck and tail whip you, and even blast rocks at you. And these rock attacks are vicious. They come out really quick, and it's a bit hard to tell just how large the rock hitbox is, and I got blasted more than a few times. Once you get his health down far enough, he even bust out some gravity magic on you, like earth bending rocks up to attack you, using a gravity well slam, and even a purple gravity blast on top of his fast movements and attack speed, making this boss a lot more imposing than I expected. The full grown falling star beast gave my endgame character a pretty good thrashing, and I was struggling to avoid his fast tail whips and slams, gravity magic, and mostly, his rock shotgun blasts, making for an almost overwhelming encounter that I enjoy quite a bit. It's always fun to dodge out of the way of these huge charges like I'm some kind of bullfighter. B tier. I think my scary, otherworldly, shadowy spirit friends might have something to say about that. These elemental generals are some pretty unique enemies, attacking you with massive sweeping halberd attacks, and I really like how his standard flag is wrapped around it. It's such a sweet little detail. And on top of these huge elemental sweeping attacks, Nile can also attack with his electrified leg prosthesis, and I'm a really big fan of his epic jump slam, but I'm not a big fan of his fast electric slash slam. This shit comes out insanely fast, and does a devastating amount of damage, and I can almost never react in time. Gotta love late game Elden Ring scaling. Also, when the fight starts, these commanders, like their name suggests, summon soldiers to fight alongside them, which forces the first phase of this fight to be fully dedicated to crowd control, and killing his summoned peons before they bend you over from behind when you aren't looking. And I feel like this fight could probably do without them. That's just my personal preference, as I find it just distracts and drags out from a pretty good overall fight every single time you attempt it. But luckily, I never had much trouble offing these guys, so I could start the fight proper. And once it's a 1v1, it's a fun and pretty dangerous fight that requires you to be able to position yourself far away from his massive elemental swings and dodging his huge prosthesis slams, making the fight a brutally fun challenge for me. B tier. <laughs> The Deathbirds are one of the most fascinating boss types in all of Elden Ring, allegedly being the keepers of death in the time before the Ur Tree. And when it was your time to go, these horrifying monstrosities would come and burn your body and soul with their ghost flame imbued rakes. God damn, I think I'd rather get freaky with the Ur Tree roots than get incinerated by this fucking thing. Maybe the Golden Order ain't so bad, cause this ghost flame is nuts. The Deathbirds attack with fast ghost flame swings, explosions, and area of effects and he even has a massive spectral spear storm that shoots out of his ghost flame wings. And the wings just look so damn cool. You can see the spirits of old death priests standing within the wings, and it looks awesome. Elden Ring's boss design details are just on another level. But fighting the death bird also means you'd be fighting the damn camera too. It's locking onto the bird, especially its head, will cause the camera to constantly swing around and end up at odd angles trying to keep up with the bird's movements and its repositioning which caused me to lose sight of the pretty large bird model and led to several deaths and ass whoopings from attacks I could barely see or anticipate. So to succeed, you'll need to lock on and off constantly and change your lock on targets to keep the bird in full view, which can be pretty annoying at times and can distract from the actual moment to moment battle. But I still found this fight to be pretty enjoyable. I love the ethereally disgusting bird design. Seriously, its body looks like petrified poop and its wide range of attacks to master and avoid kept this battle a fun challenge for me. B tier. 
The second shard bearer I took down, and the mother of the gods Rikard, Rani, and Radon, is a solid, if fairly easy sorcerer boss. Rinala has two distinct phases, and the first phase will have you attacking the currently singing slug girl graduate thing. Seriously though, what the fuck are these things? Three times in a row to burst Rinala's bubble, and then you wail on her until she reforms her bubble, and repeat until her health is at zero. And this first phase is nothing more than a gimmick, and I see it as a bit of a waste of time actually. The singing slug graduate girls can't do much besides lob magic books and drop chandeliers on you. And the only fun I really have in this phase is seeing how much damage I can do to Rinala in a single cycle. But once you whoop her good enough, her second phase will start, where we have a showdown with Rinala in her prime, in this sweet looking full moon lake area. Ranala has some pretty powerful sorceries like the Shoop the Whoop, Moon Bomb, and at worst, she can summon either wolves, a bloodhound knight, a giant, or a damn dragon to temporarily back her up, which will force you off her for a time, as going for an attack while she's got spirit backup is a good way to get dogged from behind until you're 6 feet under. But once they vanish, all you have to do is close the gap and beat her around while avoiding her sorceries, as her weak poise lets you get in some pretty heavy hits on her, and soon enough, she'll be dusted. She's probably the weakest shard bearer, at least for me, and her first phase is pretty unengaging and overlong, but her second phase makes up for it well enough, and she manages to be a decent sorcerer boss. B tier. I hate my life. I hate your life too, dude. A cross between a dragon and a troll, these massive abominations are failed imitations of the immortal ancient dragons, and they can use powerful lightning ice magic on top of 10,000 different slam attacks. These bosses are huge, and I had trouble seeing what move he was about to do when up close, as the model is just that big. But besides these camera issues, it's a fairly standard large enemy fight. Once it's damaged enough, it'll awaken its ice lightning and sprout some wimpy fucked up wings, changing up the fight quite a bit. He now launches huge lightning strike AoEs, lobs bolts at you like old Gwyn himself, and he now has way bigger jump attacks and slams. And some of these attacks look visually incredible. I love watching a boss jump up to prepare to destroy you with a huge flying slam attack and getting that timing down to perfectly dodge it is just so damn satisfying. And if these lightning attacks don't kill you, they'll kill your frame rate, cause goddamn this shit is chugging bad. The second phase of this fight, minus the frame rate hits, is a great change up in escalation and danger from the first phase, and it makes this boss a pretty memorable one. I just love the electric aura effects, the decrepit wings he grows, and the visual spectacle his new attacks bring. High B tier. A hidden remembrance boss that you can find by lighting six flame pillars in the Siofra River area, and then interacting with the glowing deer corpse to get teleported to the boss arena. And this fight is pretty damn beautiful. The music invokes some real naturalistic mystery and grace to the ghostly deer boss, and I really love it paired with his moves where he jumps and floats for a time in the air. It's great. This is what the ancient Celts must have saw in their drug-fueled visions. However, despite the great presentation, the boss is pretty easy, using pretty slow and clearly telegraphed horn swipes, flying slams, and kicks, and unlike some bosses, who have seemingly undodgeable moves, Regal Ancestor's spirit seemingly has unhittable moves, like when he runs up into the air, spraying his Regal Ancestor goop miasma all over the ground, which lands right in front of him. So as long as you aren't directly underneath him when he does this move, this shit will never hit you. The Regal Ancestor spirit can also restore his health, which is a great way to make me hate your boss, but it's actually to this deer's benefit, as otherwise this fight would simply be too easy. But overall, it's a beautiful, if simple, boss. High B tier. <laughs> I'm white! <laughs> the skinny one. These skin-suited mayo monkeys used to be the foot soldiers of the Glomai Queen, a mysterious Empyrean who would use her godskin soldiers to flay and kill the gods themselves. But it's unsure if they were assassins, a hostile army, or something else completely. The Apostle attacks with his godskin white flame and peeler, a dual-edged spear and curved sword that he can take advantage of with a combination of stabs and slashes. And when damaged enough, he goes extendo snake mode, unleashing a tornado of attacks and extending his attack reach greatly. And most of your troubles in this fight will come from you learning how to avoid these massive reach attacks, like his massive flame AoE and the move I like to call the blender, where he spins his peeler right in front of him and tries to blend up your character like he's trying to throw you into a plane turbine. But once you get a good feel for his new range and where to stand to avoid his reach, the apostle is really no problem, and it's just a solid overall fight from there. High B tier. <laughs> The fat one, who has the same flame powers of his skinny brethren, but attacks with a massive rapier and his sizable belly itself. I put the noble over the apostle because I find the rapier more visually engaging and satisfying to dodge, and I always feel juicy as fuck dodging out of the way of his flurry of stabs and his subsequent mega stab attacks. And once you get him down to half health, he busts out his second phase, where he gets even bigger, and starts rolling at you like a wild boulder, and I didn't realize you have to dodge right into it to avoid it, as if you try to dodge to the side or the back, you're gonna get hit. And it's not very clear that you can dodge right through him, 
and this model is fucking huge. So I didn't know that the iframes will last that long. So my original strategy was just to perfectly position myself behind a pillar and wait for what feels like minutes until he decides to stop tumbling. But outside of this rolling chicanery, it's a very fun fight, and it's my preferred god skin to match up against. High B tier. How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? The Lord of Stormvale and the first shard bearer you fight, who is ironically the weaker of the two boss battles here. Godric's boss fight is a great lesson in positioning, as his attacks are huge and long unleashing a long flurry of axe strikes, huge ground slams that blow up a large area, ranged whirlwind attacks, and a rolling gap closer you have to dodge. Godric does well at teaching the player that sometimes, the best way to dodge an attack is to just simply run out of the way. But this focus on positioning makes his fight a pretty methodical one, mostly waiting out attacks for openings to run in and jump attack before running away to wait for the next one. And in his second phase, Godric loudly amputates one of his many arms to graft a dragon head to it, nasty bitch, and his new dragon arm imbues his whirlwind and gap closer rolls with fire, and he can use the dragon's fire breath to deny huge parts of the arena, forcing the player to steer even clearer from these flames on top of the wild axe swing. But once you get his attacks down, you just gotta keep your distance when he's spurging out or blasting fire, run in to punish, and repeat until the bastard goes down and we claim his rune. He's not my favorite Shara Bearer to fight by any means. But his strikingly grotesque design and his wide range of attacks that teach the player about managing battles and proper positioning was always a challenging and engaging fight, even if it's nothing too special. High B tier. The cooler, immortal predecessors of the feathered flying dragons, and goddamn, they're pretty big. I'll be talking about the two ancient dragon siblings, Landsax and Fortisax who have massive red electric attacks, with Landsax using a massive electric glaive, and Fortisax using an electric spear that creates four massive directional waves, on top of lightning or deathblight area strikes to keep away from. They're faster than their flying dragon cousins, and have deadlier and longer reach for their slam attacks, and they can really pound your ass if you aren't careful. My only issue with these bosses, and this is becoming a bit of a trend, is that due to their massive size, when you run into attack one, you lose sight of more than half the dragon's model, making attacks really hard to see and react to, leading to a lot of extra hits. But besides these size issues, these are some pretty epic and engaging fights, and I love the electric oral effects coming off the dragons. It just makes them seem even more powerful and dangerous, and it makes you feel like a damn living god for felling one. Plus the scale of some of these attacks, like Landsax's glaive, are just absolutely incredible. High B tier. The Erdtree's Little Goons. Although these guys aren't that special, mostly just swinging their massive staves around, and doing a very Wario-esque butt slam that spreads either Scarlet Rot or Golden Energy based on the Avatar type. But despite these simple movesets, I just find these guys so much fun to fight, and I try to challenge myself to not get hit once when fighting them. Dodging these slow but powerful staff attacks feel great, and once you know how to best avoid their laser barrages, just run away and dodge in rhythm. These bosses are always a blast to square up to. Hi, B tier. Just because you don't see the beast, it doesn't mean the beast isn't there. I'm counting the Sword and Spear Knights together as one entry, as I believe that they're spiritually the same. The Crucible Knights are like the Black Knights of Elden Ring, strong and dangerous knights that always make your booty clench up when you encounter one out in the field. And the first phases are pretty straightforward, being full of aggressive attack combos, and these guys won't give you much space to breathe. The Sword Knight is definitely reading some inputs, as if you try to run away from him and heal, he seems to always curiously go for that huge gap closer. But once you get them down to half health, they start busting out their crucible abilities, like growing wings for a flying stab or flying slam, and they can also use a tail whip or a clawed grab that can obliterate two thirds of your health bar. They're stronger, but they're open to bigger punishes, making the second phases ironically slightly easier than the first. But overall, they're properly dangerous, have some really great designs, and they're just very fun to fell. High B tier. The Horseback Sorcerer being able to attack with their glaive like the tree sentinels, as well as unleashing several powerful sorceries while in the saddle, like conjured swords, massive glintstone arrows, and orb barrages, giving her the potential to absolutely decimate your health with spell combos if you aren't careful. And her second phase gives her even more magic to work with, like even more swords and a multi-shot spectral arrow. Loretta brought the glintstone rifle to a sword fight. It's an interesting twist on the writer boss type, and it makes her dangerous at any distance, and you gotta learn how to best dodge her magic bullets making for a pretty great overall battle. High B tier. Use the force, Luke. Equipped with one of the coolest boss weapons in the game, Elamer here has the ability to use the force and can swing his sword through the air without even touching it, with some sweet red effects to show you that he ain't using no hands. And it's a really cool gimmick that forces you to keep an eye on both his sword and his body, as his body movements telegraph his attacks. And the sword has a huge effective range to hit you from, making everywhere in the arena unsafe. And this fight is challenging, almost overwhelmingly so from the barrage of range and close-up sword attacks, 
making this fight another great encounter to learn to overcome. And you even get his sweet force sword for beating him, and I used it in my kit for a while despite its high arcane requirements, and its ash of war turns it into a medieval power drill, and it absolutely decimates enemy poise. It's an incredibly cool fight with an even cooler weapon, A tier. My favorite non-remembrance rider type boss, these deep fried tree sentinels are imbued with the power of the ancient dragons, and can use red lightning to power up their attacks and cast lightning bolt AoEs, and they even attack using a huge club made from a dragon claw. And also, their horse can breathe fire. How? Their club attacks leave huge shockwaves that can melt your health, and it gets even worse when they lightning up, making the attack shockwaves even bigger and stronger. And he can also hit you with this shield lightning strike that's got some weird dodge timing you have to master, as it hits slightly after he performs the attack animation. And it took me a little while to get the timing down just right. But overall, it's simply the most engaging rider battle, and dodging his massive electric slams is booty clenchingly tense, but incredibly satisfying to pull off. And I was locked in for the entire fight. A tier. I feel like dying. Here we go. The current final boss of Souls Like Combat, and the lady who has never taken an L in her life, Melania. Blade of. you know. I mentioned earlier that this boss is broken, and simply put, she is. Rocking the ultimate dex build. Melania has incredibly fast attacks, devastating grabs, health regen on hit, and this absolute nonsense you call the waterfowl dance. A nigh on unavoidable barrage of strikes that will delete your health bar if you're caught in it, forcing you to anticipate it and run away like Shaggy and Scooby Doo when you see her prepare it, or use Bloodhound step to blink out of existence and avoid it that way. It only gets worse in her second phase, as she now has a rot imbued waterfowl dance, massive rot blooms, and even this insane looking shadow clone assault attack. Also, Looks like Miyazaki and the boys are feeling a bit freaky making this design. Sweet wing effects though. Now you can try to take her on one on one, getting pounded into the dirt repeatedly, mastering your bloodhound step dodges, and learning what it means to have true humility. Or you can call in some backup, and make the fight much more manageable. Which is what I did. Thanks Tish. I needed that achievement. And unless you're an absolute god of souls like combat, and a god of patience too, I do not recommend taking on Melania one on one as the fight is simply not balanced in your favor, and you're gonna have a pretty rough time. But using summons brings the difficulty down from around a 12 out of 10, to a much more manageable 7 out of 10, as you and your ghostly henchmen will be able to break Melania's poise quickly, and you can even knock her flat on her ass with enough power. And then the fight becomes a chaotic brawl where you run in for hits, backpedal to dodge, and repeat. Melania's fight borderlines an experimental game design, and although I do enjoy its unique existence as a sort of ultimate Souls-like challenge, I wish it was more tuned to be a proper one-on-one -on -one duel, without it being an absolutely miserable slog. But the fantastic story connotations and the incredible presentation make this battle a broken, but extremely memorable fight, even if it's not one of my favorites. A tier. What the fuck? Probably the most fascinating boss in the entire game, Dragon Lord Placidusax is the leader of the ancient dragons, and their former Elden Lord to an unknown god that fled from them a long time ago. To access this fight, you gotta go to this unassuming floating platform in Farah Missoula and lay down in the empty grave, which causes time to seemingly stop and reverse, and it rebuilds the fantastic looking boss arena, revealing Placidusax suspended in the air, seemingly awaiting something. Its presentation is absolutely incredible, and approaching the motionless dragon lord in the massive reconstructed arena looks absolutely incredible. His decrepit design is amazing as well, and it looks as if the dragon is a broken hand, seemingly missing several heads, or fingers if you will with its entire body wrapped in its own necks. He's pretty slow to start, summoning lightning and breathing fire to keep you off of him, and attacks physically with these electric clawed swipes and this spear explosion I couldn't for the life of me get the dodge timing right on. This move was constantly blowing my ass up. Once he's been damaged enough, he starts teleporting around to attack and get away from you, and he introduces a massive flying claw strike that leaves a huge AoE in its wake, and I can only fully dodge this move around half of the time. Those massive explosion hitboxes are just too strong for me. He also gets this awesome looking double laser breath attack, and this might be my favorite attack in the entire game visually. It just looks so damn cool. But once you master how to properly dodge and position yourself against this old bastard, it goes down like the rest of his kin. What a great fight. Eight's here. I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about diabetes. Another of the demigods, and another somewhat unfair fight, but handled in a much better way than Melania. Radon is an absolute force of nature, even though he's half dead and footless from a full body affliction of divine syphilis that he got in his fight from Melania. That's just how much of a beast he is. From the back of his beloved and emaciated horse Leonard, Radon is fast and overwhelming with his attacks. But you also have some help, as you can touch several summon signs to summon NPCs to fight alongside you. And I always summon these guys, for lore purposes. 
For years, Radon's remaining followers have been trying to give him a proper warrior's death, and they hold a Radon festival at Redmain Castle, where warriors from all over come to fight him, and I'd be doing them a disservice to not summon them. Hell, there's even a hidden joke in this battle, as if you summon Patches, he will shortly leave after being summoned, seemingly shitting his pants in complete fear of Radon. Such a great little detail. And the battle is designed with these summons in mind, as they pull Radon's aggro for you to get hits in, and they can be re-summoned if they're defeated, as they have several summon signs all over the massive arena, and the NPCs themselves don't do much damage to Radon. But, if you want to, you can still just take him one-on-one -on -one if you so desire. And I usually fight his second phase one-on-one, -on -one, as he starts busting out gravity magic attacks, summons gravity projectiles and boulders he holds onto for way too long, bros edging me as I'm waiting for these rocks to just come at me and we'll do these really awesome flying corkscrew attacks, and we'll even jump up incredibly high into the air, disappearing for a bit before rocketing back down to earth like a fucking meteor. It's nuts, and I absolutely love it. It's got some incredible spectacle just from the attacks alone, and it's not too overwhelming or unfair to fight him one-on-one -on -one if you're familiar enough with his game, making for a monumental battle against a monumental foe. A tier. I just woke up in a fucking steaming mood, yeah? Cause I live in a shithole! The first big boy boss many players face, Margit appears to be some sort of tarnished, hating, homeless, old man Sasquatch beast who attacks with his walking cane. But this old man has a lot to teach you, young bloods. And Margit is an almost perfect tutorial for later bosses. He has ranged and melee attacks you have to avoid, light and heavy attacks he switches between, like when he busts out his giant gold hammer or unleashes a golden sword and cane flurry. And most importantly, he teaches you how to anticipate and react to delayed attacks with his overhead cane slam and his delayed combo swings. It's a basic and straightforward fight compared to the others on this list. And hell, it isn't even this guy's final form. But Margit sets such a great bar for future bosses, and it gets you familiar with all kinds of attack types and timings, making this one of FromSoft's best tutorial bosses to dig. A tier. He's full of dickheads! I fucking hate it! The previously mentioned final form of Margit, his true self Morgoth, the omen child of America and Godfrey. Margit was just some sort of projected illusion, and you can even fight another Margit clone out in the open in the Altus Plateau. That's the real homeless one. Morgoth cracks open his walking cane to reveal a magic sword that looks like it's made out of oily puddle water, and he's got some new tricks to take us on with. He's got all his old moves on top of some pretty crazy mobility. This dude Morgoth is a damn gymnast, somersaulting and sliding all over the arena, making his attacks much faster in this fight. He's also got a new radial spear storm move that's pretty easy to avoid, and a golden spear charge that's pretty hard to get the proper timing down on. And in his second phase, he unleashes his accursed blood flame in a last ditch attempt to kill you. And it's pretty sick. This battle is fast and brutal, but also incredibly fair. And it feels like the perfect challenge for the player at this point in the game. And it's just an overall incredible battle. And when you defeat him, he shrivels up into this charred skeleton man, saying that we'll never be able to access the Earth Tree, as it's blocked off by impassable thorns. Morgoth has had a pretty tough life. He was born an omen, is scorned by all, even his own family, and was locked underground for who knows how long. But despite it all, he still fights for his family and the Earth Tree, and he only uses his accursed blood when he's extremely desperate, denying himself extra power just to continue to cling to his ideals. And to protect the tree, he disguised himself as a homeless, tarnished, killing vagrant named Margit, who would deter any upstart Elden Lords from reaching the Earth Tree, making him one of the most complicated and empathetic characters in the entire game. And I honestly kind of feel bad for killing him. He was just trying to do what he thought was right. And that's a sign that the fight is some pretty incredible shit. High A tier. Hammer time. The first half of the final boss, in the way better phase in my opinion. Although he may not be the flashiest, or even the hardest boss, his fight is so tightly designed and well executed, it makes me place it this high. Radigan's body, much like the Elden Ring itself, has been shattered, and I really like his fairly subtle design and the detail of the Elden Ring being visible in his chest cavity. He may look human, but his blank and vacuous expression and his shattered body give him an extremely inhuman and unsettling presence I really like. Radigan uses a mix of melee and powerful incantations, and most of his attacks leave large golden explosions, making some of his dodge timings incredibly tight and hard to pull off, and I even had to change the weapon I was using to get around his high holy resistance. I feel bad for any faith builds trying to take on this boss. He doesn't give you much room for error, or to breathe, and each hit feels pretty devastating, and the pressure is always on. It's a fight you really have to master, and I really enjoyed getting better and better at fighting him, learning his tells and how to best avoid his explosions, and it's so satisfying to get to the point where you can reliably beat him, and each swing of his hammer is forging you into becoming a better player, even if the inconsistent hits in the large explosion areas can be a little frustrating at times. And he's an excellent first phase of a final boss, and I just wish he wasn't followed up by the damn cardio beast, as we might have had an all-time great on our hands, but still pretty good. High A tier. 
Malekith is up there as being one of the hardest bosses in the game, even being harder than Radigan in the Cardio Beast in my opinion. Malekith starts off as Garank, the death-eating beast clergyman who has a really fast kit of dagger attacks and beast deal incantations, like rock sling and claw projectiles. And the name of the game here is learning how to keep up with his pace and how to properly dodge his quick combos and attacks. And that shit ain't easy. The beast clergyman got some sneaky athleticism. But once he's down to half health, he then turns into his true form, the large armored wolf Malekith, who wields death itself in his massive sword. And this second phase is fucking nuts. It turns out that Malekith is actually half wolf, half Apache attack helicopter, spinning wildly in the air while shooting sword death rays at you, and the fight is constantly going airborne. Malekith keeps the pressure on you by jumping onto and off the pillars, and jumps up real high to slam down massive attacks on your head. And each hit temporarily weakens your health bar, and it also causes it to slowly burn, giving Malekith an insane damage output. And he also has this explosion move where he hops on his sword to generate a death explosion, or worst of all, this huge area of attack he creates after landing and plunging his sword into the ground, and if you're anywhere near it, you're getting hit. No question. But despite this brutal damage output, I found this fight to be insanely tense and really exciting. And when each attack has the potential to be deadly, it makes dodging these attacks feel even better. And I had a lot of fun trying to figure out when to best sneak in some attacks, and how to best punish this hyperactive mutt. And I love the visual spectacle of all his flying attacks, making this an extremely punishing, yet incredibly satisfying beast of a battle. A tier. You dare bring light to my lair? You must die! A gimmick fight in the top three? Okay, hear me out. Rykard is the best gimmick fight FromSoft has made yet. And it's just so damn fun. The arena and boss designs are again fantastic. No surprise. And this arena might be the best in the game. And that's saying a lot. The hanging cages and chandeliers suspended from chains look incredibly striking. Along with a sweet purple and orange color palette give this fight an almost otherworldly feel. But the gimmick of using the Serpent Hunter is where the fight really shines. The Serpent and Rykart are huge. And they deny you close access as the snake's body is constantly surrounded by lava. And you have to use the spear to hit him with an extendo wind poker. And you can rack up some pretty huge damage with consecutive hits. And it feels great to use. And it looks even cooler. This is some real anime shit we got going here. Giant snake versus giant wind spear. And it fucking rules. And once you kill the serpent, Rykart reveals his nasty ass face and pulls a cursed meat sword out of his snake mouth to kill you with. And now you have to dodge his blasphemous blade swings and stabs. But your biggest problem will come if Rykart summons his evil shadow skull storm to endlessly pursue you. But luckily on my winning fight, he didn't even get the opportunity to summon it, making the fight considerably easier if you can interrupt him, or if you can get lucky and he doesn't use it at all. And God help you if he does use it, cause just look at this shit. But all that aside, it's a ridiculously fun fight with a really satisfying gimmick, and I always have a blast poking this freaky serpent fucker to death, and it's a fun changer from the normal combat that doesn't overstay its welcome and it makes you feel like a total god. And also, his remembrance weapon is absolutely ridiculous. S tier. There, why don't you have a seat right over there? Okay. At the stool. Moog is Morgoth's eviler, edgier brother. Seriously, Morgoth looks like some deformed homeless furry, whereas Moog looks like a literal demon from the bowels of hell, complete with scary sharp teeth and evil black horns. But hey, at least he's got some sweet robes on. Moog has captured the Empyrean Mikola, who is the owner of that decrepit hand reaching out of the fuzzy egg at the other end of the arena. Moog has kidnapped Mickey here to try and become his consort and start some sort of dynasty of his own, despite them both being male. Hmm. Betting the eternal child god. Yeah, I think we're gonna have to kill this guy. He attacks using his huge sweeping and stabbing trident and blood flame that he can throw vertically, horizontally, or make it rain on himself. And he can summon explosions with this really cool claw slash, even if the dodge timing is deceptively difficult to avoid. I always panic dodge as soon as I see the claw marks, and then I get obliterated. And the very lore behind these attacks are really interesting, as Moog is literally cutting into and ripping apart the body of an outer god called the Fordless Mother, and attacking us with the flaming blood from her wounds. And once you get him down to around half health, he starts his second phase with an unavoidable blood explosion countdown you have no other option than to just tank through, which will force you to burn some flasks. You can get a crimson tear through a quest line to negate this damage? We ain't talking about that pussy shit. Now this would usually be a pretty bullshit mechanic, but at this point in the game, you're usually 12 to 13 flasks deep, and that just cuts into your supply a bit, giving you less room to make mistakes, and it actually makes the fight more engaging without ever feeling unfair. It's odd, but I promise it actually works well for the fight. And after completing the countdown and restoring a decent chunk of his health, he sprouts wings and can now throw blood from up on high and do several flying attacks, which can be pretty hard to see at times when you're close to him, especially when he does this overhead jump slam. I literally could not see his whole model which led to a few extra hits. And he also flings blood flame all over the arena with each attack, 
which do minimal damage, but your character still recoils from the hits, which made me panic a bit. But once I realized to not fear the floor blood, I was all good. And with enough patience and a few ass whoopings, I take down the Lord of Blood in a very close battle. Shit, he almost got me there. And it's such a great boss. From the soundtrack, the lore, the design, the arena, and his wide range of grounded and flying trident and blood flame incantations the master, makes Mogan an extremely challenging and exciting boss to take on. And he's one of my favorite FromSoft bosses, like ever. S tier. Finger licking good special. That's what I'm talking about. It's a tough call to make, and I could easily put Moog here on any given day. But for now, I gotta go with the first Elden Lord as my pick for the best Elden Ring boss. We first meet him cradling his emaciated charred son Morgoth, and he then squares up to fight us. One final test to see if we have the strength needed to become the next Elden Lord. I'm so bricked. Godfrey has two phases: his Elden Lord phase where he fights with an earth-shattering axe, swinging it around in wild combos, throwing it around from above, and even splitting the ground apart to blow up the entire area around him. And to beat him, you have to match his aggression and counter every opening he gives you, as he won't wait around for you to get in a swing or two, as he's constantly on the move. It's tough, and it's fair, and it's probably the closest we get to a pure melee one-on-one -on -one in this game. Once he's down to half health, he decides he's done fucking around, and he brutally rips apart the lion spirit on his back, which unleashes his bloodlust, turning him into his true identity, Horalu the warrior, and now all he needs to obliterate you are these fucking hands, and he will constantly go in for massive grabs and grapples like he's fucking Baki or something, and he will launch your ass into the air to get power bombed like we're in a godly WWE match, and while it sucks to get hit, it does look pretty cool, my ass is fucking cooked, and to win, you need to master his grapple and lunge timings, and punish his misses, and it's so damn fun, and it feels like the most evenly matched battle in the entire game, and there's no unfair mechanics, gimmicks, or undodgeable attacks here. It's just pure, raw skill versus the greatest warrior the lands between has ever seen. And it all combines to make it my favorite battle in the game. S tier. And well, that's my list. So, two years later, how is Elden Ring holding up? Well, just the other day, during its stage presentation, Final Fantasy Online director Yoshi P called out the upcoming Shadow of the Earth Tree DLC by name. Elden Ring DLC and said that Square Enix had pushed back the release date of their newest expansion to come out a week after the DLC, as they seemed to have no hope of competing with it, and Yoshi P himself said he wanted to play it too. So it's safe to say that Elden Ring is still a pretty huge deal. All of FromSoft's previous games were still very successful and critically acclaimed. Don't get me wrong, Dark Souls 3 is like one of my favorite games of all time. But Elden Ring has really brought them to new heights, and broke them firmly into the mainstream and was probably many people's first experience with their games. And these new players have it so good, they don't even know. Elden Ring can be enjoyed by players of any skill level with all its helpful additions like its almost complete freedom in build crafting, as well as its systems like Spirit Ashes. And enabling anyone to get into and experience these amazing games is a good thing in my book. And as for me, despite some minor issues here and there, an empty feeling map here, a brutally unfair boss there, Elden Ring is still probably my favorite game of the decade so far, and I still had just as much fun on this spring 2024 playthrough as I did in my first playthrough all the way back on release day, and it's just so easy to pick up and dive into with little overhead or bullshit, and it leaves me starving for more content. I want more elders on my ring, man, and the shadow of the Erd Tree seems to be the perfect upcoming package. More lands, weapon types, bosses, enemies, and god knows what else. And I'll definitely be doing a review on that too, for all five of you Kung heads out there. Elden Ring two years later is still a near perfect game, and with the DLC upcoming in a few months, there's no better time to dust off your Steam controller and start your fourth, or maybe fifth playthrough. Oh, Elden Ring. Oh. And before I go, you may have noticed that I haven't brought up PvP, and you'd be right. I don't touch that. But that's all I got for you today. And if you're still watching at this point, thank you so much for sticking around this long, because I really enjoyed you watching it. Goodbye.